one. Uh, this is kind of awkward, actually. See, I had this whole plan to make a video about Jehovah's Witnesses. Not so much about Jehovah's Witnesses, the smiling, generally pleasant people who knock on your door on Saturday mornings, but rather about Jehovah's Witnesses, the organization as a whole, namely its leadership, aka the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, because the way I saw things, the way the leadership, which I'll just call Watchtower for convenience, enforces its beliefs upon its members, makes it clear, made it clear to me, that this group was a cult. Uh, so that's what I was going to do. But you see, I went to Jehovah's Witnesses' official website, jw.org, and they actually have an article entitled, Are Jehovah's Witnesses a Cult? And wouldn't you know it, the answer is no. So that's it. Hit the bell, like, and subscribe. Bye! In the interest of full transparency, that was uh, sarcasm back there. We are actually going to do the thing, the thing where I talk about why witnesses are a cult. But we are going to kick things off by looking at this article because it is fascinating. So before we get into all the things said by, you know, experts and people who have dedicated their lives to this particular field of study, it's only fair to hear out what Watchtower actually says about itself. This article is found on the Frequently Asked Questions page on JW.org, and you know the fact that this is a frequently asked question might already be cause for concern. Like if you went on Arby's website's FAQ section and one of the frequently asked questions was, is Arby's a front for the mafia? Your first thought probably wouldn't be, oh, let's hear them out. I'm sure this is just all one big misunderstanding. But leaving that alone, let's see what Watchtower says here. The initial paragraph says, Witnesses a cult? No. Jehovah's Witnesses are not a cult. Rather, we are Christians who do our best to follow the example set by Jesus Christ and to live by his teachings. So two sentences in, and we're already on shaky ground. Just because a group defines themselves as Christians does not exclude them from being a cult. See the Branch Davidians. This is the old, we're not a front for the mafia, we're in Arby's defense. And after this, things start to get properly wishy-washy. What is a cult? The term cult means different things to different people. However, consider two common perceptions regarding cults and why those perceptions don't apply to us. Now, if this struck you as sort of a little completely evasive, you're right. Like, imagine you'd started to suspect that one of your friends was a criminal, and you confronted him like, Hey, hypothetical friend, are you a criminal? And your friend responds with, No, no. Well, the word criminal means different things to different people, but consider two common perceptions regarding criminals and why those perceptions don't apply to me. Also, please don't look too closely into my employment at Arby's. That wouldn't exactly inspire confidence, would it? Even though technically your friend is kind of right, there are different kinds of criminals, and people do think of different things when they hear the word criminal. But your friend is also totally being evasive about what the heck he's up to. The word cult is sort of the same way. The actual dictionary definition of the word is really vague, and your average everyday folks do tend to have differing opinions on what the word means. Even experts are starting to favor the term high control group instead of cult. But presumably, if a person is coming to your religion's website and wondering whether or not it's a cult, they don't care about what the average everyday person's perception of a cult might be. They want to know if experts, sociologists, psychologists have determined that it's a cult using complex criteria perfected over decades, which, give me a minute. Here, though, Watchtower basically dismisses the entire idea of cults as something completely unknowable, nebulous, subjective, like what even is a cult man? Why can't we all just hold hands? And instead of bothering to even come up with a definition, they list only two common perceptions, failing to cite where they're getting these perceptions from. So this is shady at best, and most remarkably, Watchtower fails its own incredibly vague, hand-picked cult perception test. So let's take a peek at that. 
Some think of a cult as being a new or unorthodox religion. Jehovah's Witnesses have not invented a new religion. On the contrary, we pattern our worship after that of the first century Christians, whose example and teachings were recorded in the Bible. We believe that the Holy Scriptures should be the authority on what is orthodox in matters of worship. Here, Watchtower doesn't seem to understand what words mean or what things are. Watchtower's reasoning here is, actually, we're not a new religion because we pattern our worship after that of an old religion, which just doesn't make a lot of sense, really. That'd be like the nefarious mafiosos at Arby's saying, yes, we were founded in 1964, but we pattern our recipe after the very first recorded sandwich by the famous Rabbi Hillel the Elder who lived during the first century BC, so when you think about it, we're really thousands of years old. I actually like Arby's. I'm not sure why they're taking such a beating here. But what we have here is an important insight into how Watchtower presents its religion to its followers and potential converts. Jehovah's Witnesses are taught by their leaders that their religion is the natural prophetic extension of first century Christianity, which was itself the next phase of true worship after Israelite Judaism. This is reinforced by the artwork in Watchtower's publications, which often display side-by-side -side comparisons between Israelites, first century Christians, and Jehovah's Witnesses as a sort of prophetic chain of capital T true worship. According to their brochure, Who Are Doing Jehovah's Will Today, which JWs are encouraged to study with anyone looking to convert, Jehovah's Witnesses rediscovered true worship, but did not enact a new religion. The time came for Jehovah to reveal the truth. He foretold that during the time of the end, the true knowledge would become abundant. In 1870, a small group of truth seekers recognized that many church doctrines were not scriptural. Therefore, they began searching for an understanding of the Bible's original teachings, and Jehovah blessed them with spiritual insight. This logic is not that not logical. There are, of course, a laundry list of differences between first century Christianity and Jehovah's Witnesses, from the fact that first century Christian congregations were not held in large places of worship, but were rather small gatherings held in individuals' homes, to the fact that to be considered an active Christian, a JW must turn in a field service report every month, like a little document, and if a member doesn't report any time for six months, she's no longer considered a member. This was not practiced by early Christians and has no scriptural basis whatsoever, to be honest. And if it seems like I'm splitting hairs with Watchtower, it's only because that's what they're doing. Their avoidance of being labeled a cult is entirely based around key word choices, hair splitting, and cherry picking, and honestly, so far, they're not even very good at it. Also, briefly, you have this weird sentence? We believe that the Holy Scriptures should be the authority on what is orthodox in matters of worship. This borders on complete nonsense, if you think about it. Orthodox in a modern religious setting does not mean what is true, but rather what is generally accepted to be true by the majority. The Bible cannot decide how a majority of people interpret it, and Jehovah's Witnesses do differ from mainstream or orthodox Christianity in some significant ways. They don't believe in the Trinity, they don't believe every Christian goes to heaven or hell, they believe accepting a blood transfusion can compromise one's salvation, the list goes on. By the literal definition of the word, JWs are unorthodox. All of this has just been dissecting Watchtower's first point, by the way, but don't worry, their second point is where things start to get juicy. Some think of a cult as being a dangerous religious sect with a human leader. Jehovah's Witnesses do not look to any human as their leader. Rather, we adhere to the standard that Jesus set for his followers when he stated, Your leader is one, the Christ. Matthew 23.10 Now, one thing you may have noticed is that these days Jesus doesn't say a lot of words out loud in person to people. So most churches have a middleman, you know, the Pope, the Father, the Mormon man, <laughs> Mr. Mormon. I don't know that much about Mormons, I'm sorry. 
And wouldn't you know it, Jehovah's Witnesses just happen to have a group of fellas at the top who claim to be literally appointed by Christ himself. And so it's time to talk about these guys. Jeffrey Jackson. I'm so surprised. I'm shocked they've given me this privilege. Samuel Hurd. A better late than never attitude? No, that is not acceptable to Jehovah. Stephen Lett. So the events unfolding around us are making clearer than ever that we're living in the final part of the last days, undoubtedly the final part of the final part of the last days, shortly before the last day of the last days. Garrett Loesch. Anthony Morris III. Our enemies. How we look forward to these enemies of Jehovah, our enemies vanishing like smoke. Mark Sanderson. Well, I asked them, what about my work? I loved my work in the service department. The brother said, just walk away. David Splain. Uh, did you know that many people are first recognizing the sound of the truth through JW.org? Kenneth Cook Jr. Hi. It's expected that all of those offering themselves to serve at Bethel or in other theocratic assignments have a clean conscience before Jehovah, having left behind all unclean practices or immoral conduct. For instance, those who have viewed pornography in the past year should not apply. The governing body, or as they call themselves, the faithful indiscreet slave, are human leaders, and witnesses are told that obeying them is the only way to understand the Bible and receive salvation. Per the October 1st, 1994 Watchtower, all who want to understand the Bible should appreciate that the greatly diversified wisdom of God can become known only through Jehovah's channel of communication. Witnesses are taught to believe that to disobey the governing body is the same as disobeying Jesus, and vice versa. The governing body continues following the Lamb, Jesus, no matter where he goes. So when we follow the direction of the governing body, we follow our leader, Jesus. We can also remember the governing body by following its instructions and direction. The governing body gives us direction through our publications, meetings, assemblies, and conventions, and all of us show respect for our leader, Jesus, by obeying the men he is using today. As recently as, what, like a couple weeks ago, over 8 million witnesses worldwide discussed this article of The Watchtower, in which it was said that one of the core tenets of faith faith, generally, is that you need to confirm that Jehovah has an organized group of people who are worshiping him under Christ's headship, and that Jehovah's Witnesses are that group. This notion that this group is the one and only true religion, one and only truth, one and only way of serving God, and most importantly, that God himself has chosen the organization's leaders, is critical because it means that a member can't criticize the leadership or its policies without, by proxy, criticizing the creator of the whole entire universe. After all, Christ appointed the governing body. Are you saying you're smarter than Jesus? But Jehovah and Jesus trust the imperfect slave who cares for things to the best of his ability and with the best of motives. Shouldn't we then trust the imperfect slave as well? And this is the entire point. Watchtower has made obeying God and obeying their man-made organization's rules indistinguishable. Take this quote from the Watchtower of uh, June 2050. I'm bad at reading. To be fully pleasing to our God, however, we must be obedient in all facets of our life. We must never deceive ourselves into thinking that we can take certain liberties with God's requirements. We can personally find satisfaction when our love for God motivates us to do what Jehovah commands, even at times when we are pressured or tempted to do otherwise. 
This includes our being willing to obey directions from those who are taking the lead in true worship, though they are imperfect. Our obedience to divine commandments and our private life is precious in Jehovah's eyes. The governing body goes so far as to call themselves the visible part of God's organization. You know, beneath the invisible part. Heaven. What's clever about Watchtower's approach here is that they regularly admit that the governing body is neither inspired nor infallible. They emphasize that they're just imperfect men trying to imitate the apostles of the first century. This is convenient for when Watchtower makes mistakes. See, every time they've predicted the date of Armageddon, or when the generation talked about by Jesus would come to an end. Instead of a failed prediction or, say, a change of doctrine being a reason to question the body's authority, it perversely becomes a reason to emphasize the body's humility in accepting what they got wrong. But also, they're kind of never wrong, really, because the ever-changing doctrine of Jehovah's Witnesses isn't due to its being run by a group of old men just sort of making it up as they go along. No, no. It's because Jehovah reveals truth gradually. The organization can't understand something fully until God allows it to be understood. Take this recent example when governing body member David Splain revealed a new understanding of the locusts mentioned in, I think, Revelation. I kind of am out loud saying this, realizing I might be wrong about that. But somewhere in the Bible, there's locusts, and that's, that's what he's talking about. Well, we might think of this illustration or this uh, explanation and say, well, that's obvious. This explanation is obvious. Why didn't we see it before? And the answer is yes, it's obvious when Jehovah's time for us to understand it comes along. But before Jehovah's time for us to understand it comes along, it isn't always so obvious. Extrapolated, this paints Watchtower history not as a series of failed predictions and false doctrines, but as a progressive religion willing to follow God's spirit, because he apparently wants people to believe in correct things sometimes, for some reason. The original Bible students, for example, proto-Jehovah's Witnesses, really, preached that Armageddon was coming in 1914. Everything was going to end in 1914. That didn't happen. But World War II, coincidentally, did happen, and that's a pretty big deal. So the way Watchtower spins it is that they weren't wrong, per se. God had revealed to them that 1914 was an important date in Bible prophecy. It's just that now he's revealed that it doesn't mean that the end of the world is coming that year. It just means that Jesus began ruling invisibly in heaven that year, and he cast the demons out of heaven, permanently banishing them to earth, and that's what caused World War II. And then in 1919, Jesus... Again, the point of this video isn't to point out that Jehovah's Witness beliefs are wrong or silly. I literally can't disprove that an invisible Jesus began ruling invisibly in heaven in 1914. The point here is to emphasize the way these beliefs are enforced and how inconsistencies are portrayed to its members. By using this sort of deceptive illogic, Watchtower can systematically whitewash their own history. The point is, Jehovah's Witnesses are taught that its leaders are God's sole channel of communication. This is not an organization, it's God's organization. Thus, everything that the leaders say is from God, Jehovah. Jehovah's Witness meetings are not where members gather to study a group of men's suspiciously authoritarian interpretation of scripture. It's where Jehovah teaches them. When discipline is offered, it's not because the elders are enacting watchtower policy. It's Jehovah's discipline. That discipline thing is important because, yeah, you're kind of not allowed to leave like ever? What should happen if a member questioned the authority, not of Jesus or Jehovah, but the imperfect men who lead by their own admission, an uninspired and imperfect organization? That person would be labeled an apostate. The Watchtower of August 1st, 1980 says an apostate is one who thinks he knows better than his fellow Christians, better also than the faithful and discreet slave, aka the governing body, through whom he has learned the best part, if not all, that he knows about Jehovah God and his purposes. He develops a spirit of independence and becomes proud in heart, 
something detestable to Jehovah. And Watchtower believes that not so great things are going to befall apostates. And here's the warning, the final end of God's enemies and how he feels about them. Now, uh, what is this place called Gehenna? Just to review it a little bit, and the Isaiah Prophecy book had some fine thoughts to aid us with this. Uh, they quote this Jewish scholar who wrote, quoting him, it is a place adjoining Jerusalem and it is a loathsome place. And they throw their unclean things in carcasses. Also, there was a continual fire there to burn the unclean things and the bones of the carcasses. Fire would be a suitable means of eliminating such refuse. Now this point, what the fire did not consume, the maggots would. Now, I don't know if you know much about maggots, but uh, you see a whole bunch of them it's just not a pleasant sight. But what a fitting picture of the final end of all of God's enemies. Sobering, yet something we look forward to. However, the apostates and the enemies of Jehovah would say, well, that's gruesome, that's despicable. You teach your people these things? No, God teaches his people these things. This is what he's foretelling. But before their brutal, fiery destruction and maggot-induced decay, the apostate will be shunned by the congregation, their friends, their family, no contact whatsoever. But shunning doesn't only apply to apostates. The threat of being cut off from your loved ones and friends looms above every Jehovah's Witness. And yeah, now is probably a good time to get away from Watchtower's own criteria and into the criteria used by experts. So far, we have an organization that believes it is the one and only way to serve God, that its leaders were chosen by Jesus Christ and are God's one sole channel of communication, and that if you question these men, you will be kicked out and shunned. Again, this is just for so-called apostasy. You can be shunned for a lot of things. The secret elders manual, Shepherd the Flock of God, oh yeah, by the way, the elders have a secret manual that nobody else in the congregation can have, it has pages upon pages of rules and things that you can be shunned for. Shunning, or disfellowshipping, as witnesses call it, is not a mere suggestion. It is an enforced and constantly reiterated practice. It is the aforementioned Jehovah's Discipline. Per the Watchtower of September 15th, 1981, a simple hello to someone can be the first step that develops into a conversation, and maybe even a friendship. Would we want to take that first step with a disfellowshipped person? JW.org misleadingly states that in cases of family, normal family relationships continue. But this is literally only a lie. The exact opposite is constantly stressed in their publications and videos. For the April 2012 study at Watchtower, what if we have a relative or a close friend who is disfellowshipped? Now our loyalty is on the line, not to that person, but to God. Jehovah is watching us to see whether we will abide by his command not to have contact with anyone who is disfellowshipped. A recent JW.org video dramatization showed the supposed benefits of parents lovingly shunning their children. They loved me and wanted me to come back to Jehovah. I tried to contact them. I just wanted to talk and to hear their voice. I missed being with my family. And they thought about reaching out to me but they knew that if they had associated with me, even a little, just to check on me, that small dose of association might have satisfied me. It could have made me think that there was no need to return to Jehovah. All this is important because the use of shunning or disfellowshipping is a hallmark of fruit farmers, yes, of course. I have decided to shun Andy Bernard for the next three years, which I'm looking forward to. 
It's an Amish technique. It's like slapping someone with silence. I was shunned from the age of four until my sixth birthday for not saving the excess oil from a can of tuna. But more importantly, it's also a hallmark of cults everywhere. But there are so many hallmarks that define cults, and Watchtower has so many of them. The set of criteria most commonly utilized today is called the BITE model, B-I-T-E. Per the cult recovery website freedomofmind.org, based on research and theory by Robert J. Lifton, Margaret Singer, Edgar Schein, Louis Jolien West, and others who studied brainwashing in Maoist China, as well as cognitive dissonance theory by Leon Festinger, Stephen Hassan developed the BITE model to describe the specific methods that cults use to recruit and maintain control over people. BITE stands for Behavior, Information, Thought, and Emotional Control. Hassan then develops each letter in the anagram, describing, for example, the sorts of behavioral control one may, but not necessarily must, see in a cult. So here, we're going to go through the relevant portions of the BITE model, and cite from Watchtower's own publications and videos to show that, yeah, they do these things. The culty things. They, they do them. And by the way, this is super abbreviated. I tried to do it for each and every point of the BITE model, and this section of the video ended up being, like, a half hour long. So anyway... Promote dependence and obedience. So whether you are an adult or a child, learn obedience by accepting disciplines that it may go well with you, and that you may endure a long time on the earth. Who wants to jeopardize his prospect of living forever by failing to learn obedience by not accepting discipline? Modify behavior with rewards and punishments. Have you ever doubted whether you will enter the new world? It is certainly good not to be overconfident since our receiving the prize of life is dependent on our remaining faithful to the end. Restrict or control sexuality. You may have to be strict with yourself when improper thoughts about the opposite sex seem to invade your mind. If the thoughts persist, try some physical exercise. The Bible says, bodily training is beneficial for a little. A brisk walk, or a few minutes of physical exercise may be all that you need to help you fight off the distracting thoughts. Above all, don't overlook the help that is available from your Heavenly Father. When I feel the sexual urges coming on, says one Christian, I really make myself pray. No, God won't take away your interest in the opposite sex, but with his help, you can discover that there are many other things to think about control clothing and hairstyle. The Bible makes it clear that Jehovah, the sovereign of the universe, has standards for the way he wants his servants to dress. So what we choose to wear should please not only us, but more importantly, our sovereign Lord Jehovah. What message is conveyed by a Christian woman's hairstyle and hair color, if dyed, or her use of jewelry and cosmetics? Is it this is a clean, modest, and balanced servant of God? exploit you financially. Our brothers, even those who are in poor economic situations, are like the Macedonians who were in deep poverty and yet begged for the privilege to give and did so generously. Restrict leisure time and activities. A certain amount of recreation is proper. However, too much time spent on leisure, entertainment, and socializing can lull a person into spending less and less time in spiritual pursuits. We must keep leisure in its proper place. For recreation to benefit us and be pleasing in Jehovah's eyes, it needs to meet specific standards set out in God's word. Information control. Deliberately withhold and distort information. Think about the apostate-driven lies and dishonesties that Jehovah's organization is permissive toward pedophiles. I mean, that is ridiculous, isn't it? Forbid you from speaking with ex-members and critics. Some of what we can hear and read is based on misinformation campaigns of apostates. It may sound convincing, even to us. 
Even if we now say, I will not believe it anyway, I'm just curious to know what it is. Exposing ourselves to this kind of misinformation can create doubt, doubts and undermine our complete trust in the governing body. Discourage access to non-cult sources of information. Satan tries to influence the way people think by using false information and propaganda. Newspapers, books, magazines, radio, TV, and the internet spread information over the whole earth. These sources offer some useful information, but they often promote conduct that goes against Jehovah's standards. For example, they may say that there is nothing wrong with same-sex marriage. Thought Control Instill black versus white, us versus them, and good versus evil thinking. Satan's system has developed the art of shaping the minds of people into fragile glass vessels with little useful purpose. In fact, Romans 9.22 refers to such ones as vessels of wrath made fit for destruction. Sometimes we hear the phrase that some of the kids in school are nicer than some of the kids in the congregation. But usually nicer actually means more fun rather than more wholesome. Teach thought stopping techniques to prevent critical thoughts. Doubt can be a powerful, destructive force. If we yield to it, it can eat away at our faith and cause us to sink spiritually. We need to fight back vigorously. How? By keeping the right focus. If we dwell on what scares us, what discourages us, what distracts us from Jehovah and his son, we will find our doubts growing. If we focus on Jehovah and his son, on what they have done, are doing, and will do for those who love them, we will keep corrosive doubts at bay. Emotion control, we're almost done, I swear. Instill irrational fears or phobias of questioning or leaving the group. Like the air we breathe, the spirit of the world is all around us. If we do not work hard to resist that spirit, it will affect us. This can begin in ways that seem innocent, such as allowing ourselves to be influenced by the thinking and attitudes of people who do not wor worship Jehovah. Or we could be affected by such things as pornography, apostasy, or highly competitive sports. <laughs> okay. Who do you think are Satan's primary targets. We are. He and the demons are like a pack of hungry lions looking to devour us. Being a publisher of the good news is a privilege that Satan seeks to attack. Are you a parent with children? Do you think Satan wants you to become unclean? Yes. He knows that devouring a family head could weaken an entire family. In the congregation, Satan would love to devour you, dear pioneers, ministerial servants, and elders. Are you in the circuit work, a missionary, a Bethelite? What a sacred privilege. But remember, it also means that we have a big target on our back. Satan and the demons would love to penetrate our clean and holy position. Very good, they all fit. That last one doesn't actually have to do with anything. It's just kind of weird. But then, you know, uh, there's a bunch of stuff about not questioning the leadership. Uh, stuff we already talked about. Weird rules about sex. Penetrate. So, yeah. Fun. Lots of fun clips and quotes that show disturbing, culty things. To recap. This is a religion that mandates absolute obedience to the leadership. Rarely will there be a difference distinguished between the human leadership and God himself. If you step out of line too many times or aren't deemed repentant enough by the elders, or if you question the leadership, 
you will be shunned. That means losing your entire social network, since you're not allowed to foster close friendships with outsiders, aka worldly people, and your family. Your family will be discouraged from speaking to you, and if they fail to shun you completely, may be restricted from certain privileges and be looked down upon by the congregation. Oh, and then you'll die at Armageddon. We didn't get to that. All non-witnesses will be destroyed at Armageddon. Fun fact. But, uh, you know, do we really need to get into that at this point? If we keep paying attention to Bible prophecies that are being fulfilled in our day, we will not be distracted by Satan's world. We will not be blind to the real meaning of world events. Christ will soon complete his victory and destroy this wicked world during the righteous war of Armageddon. Imagine how happy we will be after that. It's bad. It's all pretty bad. The whole point of making this really was to inform. Too often, Jehovah's Witnesses are dismissed as evangelical Christianity's dorky cousin, but the reality is it's a high control group. It checks every box in the cult playbook, even if Watchtower happens to use a bunch of out-of-context scriptures to back up their reasoning for doing the culty things. And this was a very abbreviated primer. So I guess to sum it up, the words of our Lord and Savior. Just walk away. Thank you all so much for watching, and a special thanks to everybody who helped contribute to the video. I'm talking Jill Owens, I'm talking about uh, Irregular Pioneer, about Mentally Diseased, Chegs at 2020, JW Review with John Maple, I'm talking about Laura Crone. And if I forgot to mention your name, I'm a terrible person. Like and subscribe.